If you look at a small to mid-sized town in North America, and a lot of European regions as well, it probably doesn't have a train connection to the surrounding towns and cities. Or if it has one, its frequency is… just sad, to be honest. One common argument I've heard for why this is the case is, but my town is too small to support the train line. In this video, I'll try to disprove this notion that small towns can support a train line connecting them to their region and country. Before the video starts, please consider subscribing. It's free and it helps out a ton. Thanks and on to the video. From the beginning of time to about the early to mid 19th century, your best mode of travel was a horse. Given enough determination and disregard for your life, you could get pretty much anywhere, even though your travel speed wouldn't be great. However, that changed with the invention of the train. Soon after that, whole regions were becoming crisscrossed with railways, bringing the burgeoning nations across the world closer together, most notably in Europe and North America. Railroads made the countries and continents they connected effectively smaller, allowing passengers and mail to travel at vastly greater speeds, compared to horse-drawn carriages. Trains also had way higher carrying capacity than horse-drawn carriages, since one train could carry hundreds of people and tons of cargo. Because of that, railways reached absolutely everywhere, even small towns and villages. Many small towns became massive cities due to being railroad hubs, such as Chicago or Los Angeles. The proliferation of railways also allowed the building of the first suburbs, fittingly called railroad suburbs. These communities offered its residents an escape from the overcrowded and dirty cities of the time, while still allowing for easy and quick access to said city. Railways were a key component in the Industrial Revolution, as goods and material could be moved outside the manufacturer's immediate area quickly. The US also benefited greatly from the expansion of railways. The westward expansion of the nation would be pretty much impossible without the easy and quick access that railways provided. The completion of the Transcontinental Railroad in 1869 finally brought the two halves of the massive country closer together, allowing for relatively cheap and fast transcontinental commerce and transport. For an example of just how big the difference was, let's look at the Pony Express. The Pony Express was an express mail service started in 1860, connecting the railway terminus in St. Joseph, Missouri to San Francisco, California. This service relied on horses, riders, and about 186 intermediate stations. The rider would pick up mail at the starting point, ride about 16 to 24 kilometers, or 10 to 15 miles to the next station. There, they would stop, eat a bit of food, get a fresh horse, and continue riding. Every 120 to 160 kilometers, or 75 to 100 miles, riders would change, so the mail could continue on its journey. With this system, mail was able to get to San Francisco in about 10 days, with the price being $5 per letter, which was later reduced to $1. Adjusted for inflation, sending a letter on the Pony Express cost $189.26, and later, $35.70. In comparison, when the Transcontinental Railroad was completed, a mail stamp cost 10 cents, adjusted for inflation, sending a letter across the country cost $2.40 in today's money. Railways were the metaphorical lifeblood of villages, towns, and whole nations, being the main way of transportation and commerce. However, a lot of them were torn out or abandoned in favor of roads and highways in the mid-20th century. I believe that this was a huge mistake, because... As of now, smaller towns and villages around the world, especially in the US and Canada, are dependent on roads to connect them to the rest of the country. For example, if you want to travel from Great Bend, Kansas, your two only options are by car or by long distance bus like Greyhound. This is even though the town has a railway line running through it and it had passenger trains running through it for decades, starting in the mid to late 19th century and ending in 1965. This passenger train line, along with many other lines at the time, were closed because they were unprofitable to run. However, we need to look deeper than that. First, building and maintaining roads isn't exactly profitable either. In 2021, state and local governments in the US spent $206 billion, or 188.6 billion euros on road maintenance. I'm not arguing for defunding roads. According to the 2021 report card for America's infrastructure, 43% of American roads are in poor or mediocre condition. 
I'm just saying that railways don't need to be profitable, and the closure of passenger rail services is more of a national transport policy decision than an economic decision. This applies to the whole world, not just the US. For example, Germany has a vast train network, but due to continued underinvestment, the quality of rail services in Germany suffers. This resulted in the country's main train operator, Deutsche Bahn, becoming a bit of a national meme. Second, the vast majority of the US's railroads are owned and maintained by private, for-profit corporations. What could possibly go wrong with that, am I right? This thankfully doesn't apply to most of the world, but still, it's important to keep in mind. And third, countries like the US or Germany or my home country of Czech Republic have massive car industries, which creates a conflict of interest when making transportation policy. However, it doesn't have to be this way. For an example of this, let's look at Switzerland. Switzerland has a very dense railway network, almost all of which is electrified, connecting all major cities, lots of small towns and even villages to each other. Even the high peaks and deep valleys of the Alps can't stop the Swiss railway network. Line C trains once per hour or half an hour, and on busy lines, frequencies are even better. However, the railways don't reach every single settlement of Switzerland. After all, that would be prohibitively expensive compared to the benefit it would bring. The Swiss implemented a solution for this problem, deep integration with other transit modes. The schedule of Swiss trains allows for short connection times, making overall travel times faster, without necessarily making the trains run faster. In Switzerland, it is possible to get on a bus in a tiny village, arrive at the nearest train station, and connect to a train in just a few minutes. According to this graph, 77% of train connections are within less than 10 minutes, meaning that after you get off your first train, you won't have to wait more than 10 minutes to get on the next one 77% of the time. People who live in areas where trains are often delayed may question the reliability of this style of scheduling, which is definitely a valid concern. However, Switzerland maintains a 92.5% train punctuality, meaning that 92.5% of Swiss trains arrive on time. This means that Switzerland can implement short connecting times without having to worry about missed connections. Even if a missed connection happens, Swiss trains go very frequently, meaning that a missed connection won't necessarily mean a large delay. This means that even people from tiny villages can use public transport to get places more effectively, without having to rely on cars. You might ask, but why do we need trains? I'm perfectly happy with driving everywhere. Here's why. First of all, train travel is way more environmentally friendly. Train travel requires far less energy to move the same amount of people than cars, especially if the railway line is electrified. In a world affected by climate change, the solution isn't obliterating the whole of Latin America or the Congo to make heavy, expensive batteries for fancy Tesla cars. It's laying, restoring and electrifying railway tracks and running trains on them. Second of all, train travel is way more socially inclusive than car travel. Owning and maintaining a car is really expensive, costing hundreds of dollars per month. In car-dependent places, like lots of rural areas, this is a metaphorical tax everyone needs to pay to participate in society. These areas are often poorer and have less economic opportunities than urban areas, and so, they are the regions hit hardest by the cost of car ownership. In comparison, train fares are usually quite a bit cheaper than car maintenance and operation. Train travel also allows disabled, other disadvantaged, too young and too old people for driving to travel independently. In a car-centric area, if you're too young, too old to drive, if you're disabled and can't drive, you're essentially stuck. If you don't have anyone to drive you places, you're stuck in your area, with no means of moving around. In comparison, pretty much anyone can use trains. And lastly, traveling by train is way safer than driving. Passengers are 8 to 10 times less likely to be injured or die when traveling by train or by a train than by a car. Encouraging train travel would save countless lives and tons of money on healthcare costs and legal settlements. In conclusion, I don't believe the argument that my town is too small for a train line in most cases. Sure, if you live in the middle of nowhere, you probably won't have a train station next to your house, but most small towns and a lot of villages are plenty capable enough to host a train station. Or at the very least, a bus line connecting the settlement to the nearest train station. 
The reason behind why we don't have that in a lot of the world is underinvestment, incompetent at best, or straight up corrupt leadership at worst, and a misguided drive to replace trains with cars in the mid 20th century. With enough investment and competent leadership, we could start effectively transitioning from our current car centric policies to a new, in my opinion, better way. Anyway, thank you so, so much for watching to the end. You're a real legend. If you'd like to support my work, I have a Ko-Fi page with three membership tiers, all of which bring you sweet benefits, like early access to my videos. There are also affiliate links to the equipment I use to make these videos in the description. Any help would be greatly appreciated. I'd also like to take this time to thank Monday's Last Brain Cell and Arrow Martian for supporting the channel with the top membership tier. I can't express how grateful I am for the support. Enjoy the bloopers. This has been Tramley and I'll see you next time. Bye. The completion of the Transcontinental Railroad in 1869 finally brought the two halves of the massive country closer to... Bro. This means that Switzerland can... Ah. Mm. Uh. The reason behind why we don't have that in a lot of the world is underinvestment, incompetent at best, or straight up corrupt leadership.